Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. We're turning. We're going to have a couple of speakers and a couple of presentations. We're going to have Henrik Edstrom and Vipal Kapoor from Autodesk, along with Carolyn Lachansky at Pixar and Sebastian Chavel at Adobe. They're going to be talking about the Hydro Renderer. We're going to ask that all questions be kept to the end, just that we can get through everything. I'm pretty excited for this talk. I hope you are too. Thanks a lot, Trevor. Uh, all right, so welcome to this talk on adding Vulkan to uh, Pixar's Hydra Storm Render. So this is an uh, ongoing collaboration between Autodesk, Pixar, and Adobe. And as mentioned, we have four speakers, so we'll try to stay on time here. Uh, so I'll start with an uh, intro to Hydra and Storm and why this is something that we see as very important to Autodesk. Uh, then we'll, Vipo will talk a little bit more about you know where we are with this project from, from Autodesk's side. Uh, Caroline from Pixar will talk about the Hydra graphics interface and how we use Vulkan there. And finally, Sebastian from Adobe will cover some Vulkan interoperability. So just quickly from our side, um, we will be making some forward-looking statements here, so please don't make any purchasing decision based on what we're presenting. Uh, these are <laughs> our current plans, but who knows, plans might change. So with that out of the way, um, our risk, we are active in uh, architecture, engineering, and construction, product design and manufacturing, and media and entertainment. We have over 100 products across these um, uh, industries, and most of our products have a need for high-performance portable graphics, so that's where Vulkan fits in nicely. And we need to support a wide range of graphics capabilities, um, ranging from 2D drawing, uh, lots of lines like we heard yesterday, text rendering and so on, to 3D modeling and design workflows, and also real-time realistic rendering in, in the viewport. And most of our products have a need to support all these different uh, draw styles. And our objectives with, with graphics at Autodesk, we want to uh, fully utilize the modern APIs, both performance and, and feature-wise. Uh, so that, of course, includes Vulkan. Uh, we want to leverage open standards and open source as much as possible. So in fact, everything we're talking about today is indeed open source. We also like uh, B-coupled architecture where we can continuously make significant changes and improvements to our graphics stack without, without having to do a lot of uh, integration work in all our different products. Um, and we also need this to be available both on desktop, mobile, and run in the browser. So if we take all these workflows, products, and our objectives all put together, um, that has led us to the decision to base our viewports on Hydra and Storm. So what is Hydra and Storm? They are both part of Pixar's open USD library uh, that Pixar open source in 2016. Um, Hydra is this decoupling framework that um, decouples how you describe the scene graph from how you render it. So it allows um, the application to describe the scene through something called a scene index uh, to Hydra uh, without having to worry about how it's going to be rendered, what um, render, what API to use, and so on. Um, so you can have multiple different scene indices feeding scene data into Hydra, and that represents the multiple heads of the Hydra. So if you can also imagine that Hydra having multiple tails, these are called render delegates, um, and you can have multiple of those as well. And the one we're going to focus on today is Storm, which uh, is a fast rasterizer. Um, it's, again, also part of OpenUSD from Pixar. And from Autodesk, we see Storm covering the vast majority of the, the graphics needs for our viewports, you know, most of the, um, the draw styles that I, that I showed earlier. But we do also have something called Aurora, which is another open source renderer that, that we open source from Autodesk. And that one is specifically focused on, on uh, realistic rendering, so real-time path tracing. Um, Aurora uses uh, Vulkan ray tracing. Uh, we won't have time to cover Aurora in this talk, but we we have one at SIGGRAPH that I will link to uh, later if you want to know more about that one. Um, also, quick plug to Teresa's talk earlier. We use Slang exclusively in, in Aurora. I'm super happy with that. So, um, um, yeah, if you're interested, please take a, a closer look at Slang. Um, there are other vendelias. We have Arnold, of course, from from um, uh, from Autodesk, uh, which is more specifically focused on production rendering and you know film VFX type of workflows. And there are many other render delegates as well. Uh, Pixels Renderman, uh, of course, uh, being another one. 
So underneath Storm and Aurora, we have another abstraction layer called a Hydra Graphics Interface, which uh, abstracts the, the low-level APIs, starting with OpenGL uh, in, uh, initially, uh, but now supporting Vulkan and Metal. And we also have um, DX12 and WebGPU backends in the works. And, and all of these are uh, being developed in the open source. So if you're interested, you can find, find them all through uh, uh, the OpenUSD Git repo. So um, I hope I explained that, you know, Hydra and Storm really checks all the boxes of what I um, presented earlier. It has this very elegant uh, decoupling. Um, and, um, you know, it's fully open source, based on open standards, uh, OpenUSD, MaterialX. And you can kind of view Hydra itself as uh, becoming a de facto standard at this point. Uh, and it allows us to utilize all the modern APIs. So today's talk is going to focus on, on Storm and, and how we uh, use Vulkan there. So with that, I'll hand over to Whipple to talk uh, more in detail on, on where we are with this project from, from Autodesk. The uh, Autodesk graphics platform team. Uh, some of the immediate demands uh, of the Autodesk platform team are one, to be able to render large models for industrial applications. For some context, these models are not authored from an optimization perspective. So the size of these uh, files can range from a couple of gigabytes to hundreds of gigabytes. Uh, have billions of triangles and millions of independent primary resource allocations. And uh, depending upon the industry, the texture usage can vary. Two, we are looking to render on different uh, form factors and different platforms with uh, Win Linux, Windows, and Android being uh, being our target platforms, apart from iOS and macOS. Three, uh, we wish to be able to exploit hardware accelerated features like hardware ray tracing, uh, mesh shaders, and, and AI for rendering whenever we get there. As you can understand, uh, Vulkan really plays an important role in this journey for us. And uh, through Vulkan, we're able to, one, exploit our hardware more effectively than uh, legacy APIs could, uh, two, address our cross-platform demands, and three, make use of that next generation hardware acceleration support. Uh, so we at the platform team have adopted OpenUSD to meet our uh, visualization needs and demands. And uh, we aim to work with the open source community to accelerate our development and adoption cycles. Uh, we aim to sub uh, stabilize and mature the HGI Vulkan backend for Windows, Linux, and Android platforms, and uh, solve large model loading and viewing complex um, large model viewing uh, challenges and add it to the OpenUSD's ecosystem. The image uh, you're seeing to the right uh, is an oversimplified view of the OpenUSD stack. Uh, there is a default USD-based scene delegate that uh, feeds the implementation, and uh, you can also add custom scene delegates and extend the scene representation support. Similarly, there is a default render delegate called uh, the Hydra Graphics Interface, and uh, this is implemented to OpenGL, Metal, or Vulkan backends. And you can also add custom render delegate support that can render parts of the frame simultaneously. Uh, digging in a little deeper into the default render delegates uh, Vulkan implementation, um, HGI makes use of uh, Vulkan memory allocator for resource allocation and memory management, uh, uses shader C to compile from GLSL to SPIRV, and SPIRV reflect to generate the necessary data structures for descriptive set management. Um, here is a little more detailed uh, view on uh, how this ties into our sandbox application. Um, Vulkan-based presentation and swap chain management is currently not part of the USD's framework, so uh, the necessary Vulkan handles are uh, borrowed from the OpenUSD stack to manage the presentation and composition at the application side. Uh, our sandbox application acquires the final render target uh, from the USD stack, composites it with our MGUI based user interface and presents it. And uh, we are currently stable and capable of rendering mid to large size models across all our platforms. So uh, we started exploring OpenUSD with Vulkan about uh, 10 months ago. And since then, uh, we were able to uh, fix uh, uh, stability issues uh, related to Vulkan, uh, HGI Vulkan, uh, build OpenUSD on Android, uh, provide a Vulkan-based OpenUSD backend to our sandbox application, and uh, be able to successfully run on Windows, Linux, and Android platforms. We were also able to get Vulkan to work with our CPU-based HLOD implementation uh, that currently works on our proprietary asset formats. Um, we are soon going to be making our implementation format independent and uh, GPU accelerate parts of it. Um, also in August 2023, we presented some of our progress at SIGGRAPH and we're currently collaborating with Pixar and Adobe with the aim to bring HGI Vulkan to feature parity with uh, OpenGL and Metal backends and expand and complete the unit testing 
unit testing support. Um, here are a few screenshots of the Sandbox application running across the platforms. Uh, since we mostly are working with proprietary formats and client data, we could not bring you those screenshots that better represent the renderer's abilities. Uh, that being said, we are currently stable and capable of rendering models uh, the sizes of up to three to four million polygons or larger across all the platforms. Um, considering that we are building OpenUST with Vulkan across different platforms, we also see value in building the right tooling infrastructure for our development uh, journey. And, uh, and we also get support for tooling and stability from Qualcomm, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, and Lunarji, and we thank them for their time and effort on this. So please allow me to leave you on the slide for a few seconds. Finally, some immediate next steps uh, that we are working on are uh, one, ensuring that Vulkan implementation is spec independent, uh, sorry, spec compatible and runs across all vendors, uh, all vendor GPUs. Uh, we're looking to provide render graph support and uh, GPU accelerate parts of our h implementation and provide occlusion culling support. And uh, finally, we're exploring Swift shaders for server side infrastructure where there are no GPUs available. So if you're working on Swift shaders or any other software rasterization based framework, for Vulkan, uh, we would love to know your journey in this process. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Caroline. I'm a software engineer at Pixar. I'm going to talk a bit more about the Hydra graphics interface or HGI and some of the design choices we made while working on it. Um, thank you, Henrik and Vipple, for introducing the concepts of Hydra and HGI. Um, I just want to provide some more context and history for the software. Um, so when Hydra was first dreamt up in 2014 at Pixar, it was originally designed as an OpenGL render meant for viewing USD, which is Pixar's open source scene description framework. Um, and it was kind of meant to serve as, as a ground truth render for USD assets. Um, and then once the concept of the Hydra render delegate was introduced and we figured out there'd be a need for other render delegates someday, such as for our other renders like RenderMan, um, the OpenGL render portion of Hydra became what is now known as Storm. Um, and Storm is used today at Pixar as the viewport render for USD View um, and for our animation software application, Presto. Um, it's, it's open source, it chips with the rest of uh, USD, and so it can be found in a number of uh, external applications as well. Um, and then a few years after Storm's creation, it became apparent that we'd want to support graphics APIs besides OpenGL, um, both for Pixar and for external users. Um, and we knew we wanted to shift away from OpenGL to Vulkan eventually. Um, and, but it was important to us that whatever transition we did would not disrupt our daily users of the software at Pixar, either in image correctness or performance. Um, so we came up with a HDI or the Hydra graphics interface. Um, HDI is an abstraction layer for graphics APIs. The OpenGL implementation, HDIGL, um, is what we use at Pixar today. Uh, we recently collaborated with Apple to work on uh, HDI Metal, which is the Metal implementation. Um, and we're currently collaborating with partners like Autodesk and Adobe to get HDI Vulkan up to speed. Um, and like I mentioned, this is of, of special interest to us at Pixar because we uh, believe it's the future for our software as we transition away from OpenGL. Um, so next, I'll talk about some of the challenges and design choices we made as we've worked on this. Um, so as I mentioned, Storm was first written with OpenGL in mind. Um, and that has a lot of uh, lingering effects, even as we remove all the direct GL from Storm. Um, and kind of conversely, HDI was initially written with more of a, a modern graphics API mindset in mind, um, which meant making it work for OpenGL wasn't always trivial, and we end up faking a lot of concepts. Um, so for example, HDI has the concept of, of graphics commands and, and commute commands where you can add your commands to this, this uh, object, and then they're later submitted. Um, and this lines up uh, with the Vulkan concept of creating a command buffer, recording commands in the command buffer, and then uh, submitting the command buffer to a command queue. Um, and to simulate this in OpenGL state machine, we instead do something like accumulating a list of um, C++ functions to call, where each function is a, um, a, a lambda with a, a GL call or a sequence of GL calls inside of it. Um, and then when we're ready to submit, we'll capture the existing GL state, then run through and execute this um, stack of, of GL calls, and then restore the GL state so the user's starting state is not altered. Um, and even now in our software, there's a lot of uh, lingering GL code um, as we deal with both like performance and, and correctness implications of switching to go solely through HDI. Um, HDI as it is now with all of its abstractions and obfuscations is, is sometimes just less performant than calling graphics API functions directly, um, which is something we're trying to mitigate. 
And this lingering GL presence isn't always just code. Um, a lot of our applications and Tessa Pixar still just want a GL frame buffer at the end of the day. Um, texture formats that we use are not supported in Vulkan and need conversions. Um, in general, we were doing a lot of things with OpenGL and Storm that will raise uh, validation errors with Vulkan, um, like binding resources that aren't actually referenced in the shader or declaring resources in the shader that aren't actually used. Um, so Vulkan validation layers have been supremely helpful as we're working on this project. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into the detail um, that we've done in our, our shader system uh, for HDI. So at Pixar, language, uh, at Pixar, we have a domain language called GLSLFX to define storm shaders. Um, and you can use GLSLFX to define your imports and, and configurations, and then the actual shading code, which we kind of bundle into things called shader snippets. Um, and the final version of the shader to be given to your target API is assembled at runtime. Um, so like I said, the original shading language of choices is kind of GLSL. Um, and though these shader snippets are written in GLSL, we basically want a shader snippet to be kind of a, like a modular algorithmic expression where the concepts reference are kind of independent of any specific shader language. Um, and then the final version of a shader to be compiled is, is typically composed of many GLSL shader snippets that are assembled based on a number of factors, such as your rendered objects, primitive type, display settings. So there's a lot of factors. Um, so like I keep saying, we've been using GLSL um, this whole time. And originally, the shader resources were often just hard-coded into the GLSL shader snippets. Um, and by shader resources, I mean things like the vertex stage inputs, the fragment stage outputs, um, any interstage attributes, uh, interpolation modifiers, location of binding indices, um, and just the various other shader options and layout qualifiers that you might use. And so this current strategy doesn't work if you want these shaders to be usable with any graphics backend, um, which is the goal of HDI. Um, different shading languages can have different names and syntaxes for the same concepts. Um, and even Vulkan's GLSL, which is generally very similar to OpenGL GLSL, has some small differences. Um, similarly, the binding indices of resources um, in your shader for a Vulkan GLSL shader might be different for your OpenGL GLSL shader, just for various reasons. Um, so we want a way to specify and generate uh, shader code for shader resources in an API and, and shading language independent way. Um, that's where we've introduced the concept of shader resource layouts. Um, so to deal with this problem, we extended GLSL FX to include a layout section, which defines the shader resource layout for a, a corresponding GLSL section of the same name. Um, these resource layouts are written in a simple JSON format, um, which gets processed at runtime to fill descriptors, which are later translated into actual target shading language code um, by our HGI shader gen system, which I'll talk about more in a second. Um, and here's a pretty simple example of this resource layout section in action. Um, so these are two shaders written in GLSL FX. Um, so originally on the left, we just have a GLSL section called mesh.vertex. Um, the code here is a, it's a really abbreviated version of a vertex shader we use for meshes. Uh, you can see we define a vertex stage output um, consisting of a position in a normal and I space. And this is pretty GLSL specific. And again, while we use GSL, GLSL shaders for Vulkan, um, we'd probably want to give this uh, vertex stage output a location qualifier for Vulkan GLSL. Um, so on the right, we have it with resource layouts. And so we define a corresponding layout section for mesh.vertex. Uh, so we use some JSON to say that we have an output block of type vertex data with name out data. And it's got two members, a VEC4PI and a VEC3NI. Um, and this JSON gets processed at runtime to produce the correct shader resource code for the target API. And the rest of the shader snippet can, can remain untouched as Though it's written in GLSL, it's a basically viable shader um, in other shading languages. So I keep mentioning this runtime processing of uh, resource layouts and shader snippets. And a lot of that happens through our shader gen system. Um, so this shader gen process allows us to generate target shading language code from lists of API independent descriptors. Um, and these descriptors are generated from a, a number of places, including the resource layouts I just uh, showed, um, as well as places like analyzing our buffer and texture resource metadata. Um, so you can see an example of one of these descriptors on the right. Um, this one's describing a texture to be cleared in the shader. So it has the name of the texture, its dimensions, bind index, really anything you need to declare in the shader. Um, so each graphics backend's implementation of the shader gen API will process these descriptors to generate shading code for their API, um, as well as compiling and linking that code and so this allows us to abstract away each 
uh, API specific needs and any differences. So if built-in functions have different names in different training languages, we can hide that within the Trader Gen code. Um, and the same goes for different styles of resource declaration, um, keywords, extension names. The Shader Gen API also abstracts the compiling and linking process for shaders. So for example, um, the HGI Vulkan Shader Gen has a step to compile the Compose GSL shader to, to Spurby, which is of course different from our HGI GL compilation process. Here's a really simple illustration of how we use uh, the Shader Gen API to deal with shading language differences. So OpenGL GLSL has um, a built-in vertex stage uh, input variables, GL vertex ID and GL instance ID. And Vulkan's GLSL uh, replaces that with GL vertex index and GL instance index, uh, respectively. And in middle shading language, there's totally different names. Um, so we'd like our shader writers to not have to think about this at all um, when they're writing shaders. So we create these new variables called HD vertex ID and HD instance ID, or HD is just the, the prefix for Hydra. Um, and we map them to the concept or, or role of a vertex ID or instance ID. And then each backend's implementation of shader gen will emit the correct shader code um, defining HD vertex ID and HD instance ID, which whatever built in uh, variable name makes sense um, for that shading language. And this can even account for slight differences in, in actual meaning of built in variables uh, between shading languages. Um, and so now you can use these uh, variables with the HD prefix uh, in your shader without worrying about the, the back end. Um, and we end up doing something like this for basically all of the shader built ins we need to use. So hopefully that illustrated some of the work we've uh, done to transition from an OpenGL renderer to a system that could support multiple graphics APIs. Um, and now I'll pass it to Sebastian. Hi, I'm Sebastian Chevrel from Adobe 3D and Immersive. I work on the Substance family of 3D apps. And today I'm going to talk about interoperability of uh, GPU resources in a complex Hydra application. So why am I talking about this? Um, at Adobe, we're building a framework to develop our next generation of 3D apps that's based on USD as the, the file format and also the, the data representation in memory for the application and using modern uh, you know, GPU APIs like Vulkan and Metal under the hood. Um, so in order for those applications to be performant, we need to have a way to uh, have the different modules of the application uh, interoperate at a low level uh, their GPU resources so they don't make any CPU copies. So the modules being uh, the render, which uh, you know was developed by a, a different team completely in a vacuum using uh, directly uh, Vulkan or, or Metal as their, as their API. Then we have the Hydra Delegate, as was shown before, that's the layer where the renderer interfaces with the with USD and the scene description. Um, then we also want to support, um, at a framework level, uh, all the in-viewport 3D UI that a typical app uh, needs to have, like selection highlighting, gizmos and manipulators, uh, and color management. And finally, uh, the traditional 2D UI panels that, in a modern, uh, UI toolkit are also rendered on the GPU and composited on the GPU. So uh, we're trying to have all these uh, components talk to each other, uh, sharing resources on the GPU without necessarily knowing about each other and also coordinating the lifetime of those resources. So the first uh, thing is how do you share uh, buffers between multiple Vulkan instances? Um, so there's an extension of Vulkan external memory that's been part of core since 1.1. And this allow you uh, to tag uh, some uh, allocation blocks uh, to be shared. Um, and then you can uh, export opaque handles that are different by OS, but on a Windows handle or a file descriptor on Linux. Uh, and along with some information like the size of your memory pool, the allocation offset and the type of memory, other Vulkan instances can recreate those resources pointing to the same shared memory. So the zero copy uh, um, uh, resource in a different instance. Um, so you may need some synchronization uh, in certain cases. We're not doing complicated cases. It's a, you know, only the renderer is writing to those resources. All the other components are reading from them. So all we all we're doing is really making copies uh, in order to avoid tearing. Uh, but if, if if multiple components need to write to resources, you may need to use semaphores and other synchronization mechanisms. Um, 
Typically, the external memory extension has been used to share data across Graphics API um, between OpenGL and Vulkan, between Vulkan and DirectX. Um, when we embarked on this project, there wasn't a lot of resources out there on sharing uh, Vulkan to Vulkan. So that's why we thought it would be an interesting topic to share our, our learnings. The second um, thing that you have to worry about where you're sharing resources across different components is that um, you have different modules that use those resources synchronously in different threads. So um, you can't just destroy resources when you're done using it in one module, especially if you don't know about the other modules. So you need to have some sort of global garbage collector or, or a deletion queue system uh, where the last user of a resource, which is always the UI typically, uh, can signal, okay, I'm done showing this resource now, and then the various components can be notified and, and destroy the resource only then. Um, and again, making copies can help shorten the, the, the length of the chain of dependency. So this is an example of a typical application. You can see the different modules here, the renderer, the framework, which is shared by several uh, applications, and then the UI, which is unique to each application. Um, and in the dotted line, you see the boundaries of the different Vulkan instances. So um, you can see here how the resources are shared using external memory handles, uh, the, the framework layer owning the resources and the renderer and the UI sharing the memory and how the garbage collector um, flows back from the UI to notify the other um, modules that the resource can be uh, disposed. So what's the support for USD? Uh, what's the support in USD for interoperability? Um, currently, HDI does not uh, support external memory, uh, and the HDI that, uh, the interop that HDI does support between graphics API is using a slow CPU path. So our our approach at Adobe initially has been to modify HDI to allow us to wrap existing GPU resources inside of an HDI texture. And that has allowed us to use a lot of the uh, machinery that comes with USD, including USD Imaging GL, and, and basically work the same way that the HD Storm renderer works. Um, but at Adobe, we have our own uh, API abstraction layer, which is very similar to HGI. It, it abstracts um, Metal, Vulkan, and uh, um, other APIs. So we're moving away from using USD Imaging GL completely and, and using our own API for interoperability going forward. But regardless, we thought it would be interesting to, to share what we're doing. And, and we think it might be valuable for USD in the future to support external memory by allowing you to create resources that you can use in other instances or import resources that were created by other instances. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about compatibility and issues. When we started this project and we were asking around the graphics community and uh, graphics engineers at, at Adobe, um, the, the, the word was that there'd be dragons using uh, uh, interoperability. And, and uh, we heard a lot of warning that it was going to be very fragile and that it's prone to breaking on different uh, hardware permutations or driver versions. But um, in our experience, this might be an outdated belief at this point. At least we have yet to run into any issues. Uh, granted that this is a platform that's in development, so uh, it hasn't seen really wide exposure to a, a lot of different uh, permutations uh, uh, in the wild, but it's worked really reliably for us on Windows and Linux, at least on the high-end. Um, hardware that's typical of VFX uh, workflows. Um, but yet, then again, this is a new platform, so uh, it's an only be tested internally, and uh, we may have surprises when it's uh, released wildly. But um, yeah, we just wanted to share uh, our learning in this domain. Thank you. Can you actually give you a brief summary of what these links point to? Yeah, just a collection of different links to you know, OpenUSD, where to find all the source code, um forums uh aurora that i mentioned and they're also using vulcan ray tracing if you're interested in that um and you know a couple of email addresses if you want to get in touch with us all right thank you thanks